and Iñaki and I, we are going to tell you how we are going to install implants, grounds, and all together, because it's more or less a teamwork what we would like to explain today, because we have to know what the dentist has to know, and vice versa, because it's very important that we are going to create something on the soft gingiva, soft gingiva. so we have to know what we can do with the soft gingiva. On the other hand, a dentist has to know which are our you know, problems to solve a good solution, because very often we have to discuss about pitfalls, because we want to show you three cases with three different pitfalls, how we can solve them, were this foreseen, the pitfalls or not, how we can solve them, and what we, can have, we, are, what we have learned about these pitfalls. So you see, it will be a combined lecture, creating the abutments, implants, and all that stuff around. So basically, we, will se we selected uh, three cases, because we were asked to do, talk about pitfalls, and we didn't know which case to select, but basically we will show you two adjacent central incisor, central and the lateral incisor. We'll show you a case where we need to fix an implant that already was there and the problems that we got to really to get there. And then the final case, a defect case, a really difficult case as far as controlling the soft tissue, the scalloping, etc. So when it comes to two adjacent implants, and here uh, number 12 is a, is a failing tooth with, an, uh, with a periapical lesion, and we have to come up with uh, placing two implants together. For me, as a technician, or as a dentist who focuses on soft tissue and volume, uh, it's crucial to have an idea about how you are going to approach the case. Maybe this is the most important issue today, especially when you have a tooth uh, that is failing, uh, the patient is waiting for you to do the best result. And for me, I will never do two implants at the same time. So I think the timing is something really important. For me, the objectives are clear and are based on the situation. But basically, this is an overview about being minimally invasive is maybe the key to success. I sincerely do not agree with, for example, Egon, that you need two millimeters of bone or only grunder. <laughs> I don't agree at all. You do not need on single teeth you do not need on few teeth two millimeters of bone outside of your implant. This is not nature. And uh, basically, for me, you can, if you have enough bone uh, to place your implant, you can compensate that volume loss with connective tissue. And those are cases that will be showing you that uh, are long enough there to really uh, show the success, the effective success, and the long-term stability of the situation. For me. In this case, I will do an alternative implant. Which one I will do? The delayed or the immediate first? For me, the most difficult will be the delayed implant placement. I want to make sure that the central incisor is perfect. And as that Eric stated before, you know, for me, I always keep the tooth in case I fail with the implant treatment. And this is maybe the most intelligent way of approaching these cases. So if I have enough bone, I don't do bone graft. I never don't do bone graft anymore. If I have enough bone graft, enough bone to place my implant, people tell me how much is that? Four millimeters for me is more than enough. Obviously, if I have adjacent teeth, uh, the approach about doing the soft tissue is important. I never expose the bone if I don't need to. So I do everything is partial thickness, no vertical releasing incision. This is the dinosaur era. And compensate the volume with connective tissue. When it comes to after I finish my central incisor and everything is perfect all the way to the crown, then I will focus on the lateral incisor with uh, an atraumatic extraction, flapless. I will try to do a 3D bone packing between the bone and the socket. I think this is something important. And mainly, I will deliver the final abutment 
the same day. This is something that is not important. What is important is the connective tissue. What I deliver the abutment, because I think is an ease, uh, it really fa uh, speeds up the process and for the patients too. So we'll show you what I did and the pitfall of this case, which one it was. So I will show you later on. This is the uh, implant and the healing abutment and the connective tissue is done at the same time. Once everything is healing, uh, as everything goes along uh, really nicely, we placed our final, abut uh, our final abutment in zirconia from day first, and we um, um, relined the provisional that was already there before. And once uh, everything was growing and was pushed back and was uh, uh, the scalloping was corrected by the abutment and the, and the crown, we were ready then and everything looked nice. We were ready in a sense to uh, go to the next stage that was extracting the lateral incisor. Sometimes we wait for controlling the soft tissues and uh, three months later, we placed our uh, lateral implant, immediate implant placement with connective tissue graft at the same time with the final abutment. Now time was, uh, this is the central incisor, x-ray, and this is the two weeks of my immediate implant placement, and this is six months later. As you see here, you can see how the bone has been uh, uh, modified and uh, readapted as uh, times goes by. So this is my final abutment, my final provisional. I redid the second provisional because, as previous people said, the guy that does immediate and single teeth is kind of uh, obsessive compulsive. My problem was that the mesial aspect of the lateral incisor uh, was really too. Uh, too far to the buccal, and then I was having problems as far as uh, having a coping and a crown, especially on the lateral incisor, due to the rotation of uh, the central incisor and position of the lateral. So I took my uh, color. Uh, here it was pretty much straightforward communication because uh, Patrick is in, uh, in Belgium, so sometimes... Uh, we have big difficulty, and with the next one, we will show you what we mean by that. But in this one, it was pretty straightforward for me. Maybe the most important way of communicating color is the value of my restoration. The rest is contour and texture, and everything uh, goes. So I treat uh, implants like teeth, and I do take uh, an impression with uh, one chord uh, technique. It's more than enough to really come up to uh, this situation. And this basically, with this picture, uh, you can see the problem. The problem is basically on the mesial aspect buccal of the lateral incisor, where my abutment that was designed by myself is not, uh, doesn't allow and doesn't leave as much uh, space for, for uh, my technician to really be able yeah, to have his coping Louis. and porcelain on top of it. And this is due to the support that I wanted to provide to my interproximal papilla between the two central, the two implants, which was maybe the most difficult uh, aspect to maintain. Uh, so what I would like to, to say, as far as soft tissue and surgical approach, we had the connective tissue graft done on the central incisor. And once I did the connective tissue graft uh, on the lateral incisor, I regrafted interproximally between the two implants in order to thicken that tissue as much as possible. So you have seen that Inyaki created a great provisional. We take some alginets and we have the master cast, and then we are going to analyze uh, the shape. So we have the gingival lines, we have our uh, angle lines, we have uh, the root connections, we have the contact points. So we have to analyze everything before we start to create our coping. Because, because you have seen the first pitfall was how much space we have to build up the crown, a good looking crown with a normal color. 
So this was a pitfall and how we can solve this. It was very tough because normally how twisted the teeth are positioned, the R should be regular. If you look occlusally, it has to be one in harmony. So if you look at the teeth, in the natural teeth or this wax up, you see that the uh, third of the edge is always direction palately. So normally if you have an abutment which is too far placed to the buckle, then you have some problems with your basic color. So to solve these problems, there was no uh, solving any longer because we have to deal with the situation like it was. The abutments were placed definitely in the patient's mouth. And so then we have to deal. You look also at the incisal edge, milling parts, so we have to create this also in our final restoration. So this means that we have to check the movements in our articulator. So if we have a perfect mastercast of the situation in the patient's mouth, we take some indexes, and in that index we have to create all of them. And then you can see that we have a lot of space to fill in, because not other buckles, because we can't create the, the lateral incisors too much to the buckle, but this means that we can create a double scanning, or in CAT CAM situation, we have to create our copings. Our copings are more or less 0.6 millimeter. I never go thinner because I don't like to see a broken crown in the patient's mouth. So my standard thickness of the coping, single or multi-unit or whatever, it's 0.6. Sometimes you can reduce this until 0.5. But you have to Im Im uh, imagine if you uh, have a coping from 0.5, and then you have to build up some ceramic, then you have some problems because we need actually volume to create a perfect basic color. Otherwise, if you grind everything back, then you have to stain and to paint, and we don't like it. We have our coping. We have to, <coughs> to deal with a semi-translucency. This means that we, in other cases, can mask actually discolored teeth, not a when they are black, it's very difficult. And then we create some copings. So we create some copings in our index. And this is very important to avoid the chipping. We all know something about chipping. We all have seen this, how we can solve this. Normally, the substructure is one of the most important things to uh, avoid the chipping. First of all, substructure, then how to treat the zirconia. How is the protocol to fire your ceramic? And then after adjustment in the patient's mouth, finish it very high. So we come later back on the polishing of uh, our crowns because sometimes you have to adjust your occlusion, pre-molars, molars, and then it's very important to finish it in a high polishing way. Fluorescence, we have seen this in the lecture before. We always use a fluorescent material, fire it very high on our coping to get a very good mechanical retention to the zirconia and to the ceramic, because this is the first layering. We need connection, and we all know out the uh, literature that we have a mechanical, mechanical retention ceramic zirconia. Before we start to build up our crowns, we manipulate a little bit the uh, master cast, and this is always a certain communication. I phone to Inyaki, how much, how can I uh, scratch away because I need some space for my buckle outcome. Very often we have to create a buckle more over contoured marginal area. You can see issues that we could uh, talk about is yeah. whenever we place our cord, 10% uh, is provided, yeah. the contour is provided, that 10% is provided by the full contour of the, of the provisional. And this is what you are missing into your model. That's yeah, why that's I'm asking you all the time, listen, yeah, yeah. here the emergence profile will be towards the distal, towards the mesial, that's watch right. out, because as you place the cord, mm -hmm. everything is a ring, Collapse. and everything collapses towards that's the center. Correct. So usually the technician, a master technician like you, yeah. catch up yeah. things like that, where you can Absolutely, create yeah. an emergence profile and come up to the same emergence profile that you are desiring. That's correct. This in green, you can see the pitfall, because this was the outline. And before the outline, I have to build up with my ceramic. My layering technique, I will explain this just in a few seconds, because in the, front, in the anterior region, I don't like to see monolithic crowns. And I have my reason for this, because if you want to try to create an individual crown or a 
tooth, then you have to layer it color by color. If you paint on stain, I don't believe in it because you block the light. Normally, it's based on metal oxide. You can see this under fluorescent, under fluorescent light. So it doesn't make sense to paint or stain your basic color from an A2 until an A3 or something like that. My layering technique is based on a few powders. We build it up, enamel, we layer some individual characteristics at the incisal edge, and we fire this. Normally, I do this always in two steps, because if I have not the best day in my week, and if I have, if I have to take some too much yellow or too much translucency that can kill your restoration, then I have to just take a burr, I grind it away, and I take my second layering. During the second layering, I'm using just some translucency, I created some halo effect with another dentin because we would like to see an internal life of different colors. And this is very important that you build up step by step different colors in your incisal edge. Very important when you have our base situation, our contact points are not points, these are approximal areas because from the incisal opening the embrasure until the papilla, it has to be closed and polish it in a perfect way. You can see the lateral incisor, how thin my marginal ridge to the mesial side, the angle is. So therefore, I am now for sure that we have to stain a little bit. This was our pitfall. The second pitfall was we mounted this in the articulator, we have our Position at abutment, I have my coping, I layered a little bit, and in my mountain articulator there was space enough. We did our movements, nothing was wrong. Afterwards, when Iñaki took the crown in the patient's mount, we have seen that there was an overcontact. This means there is more or less a big immediate side shift, bigger than or larger than one millimeter. This you can't detect directly in your articulator. The best articulator is the mount. So if you have touched your coping, this is zirconia, then you have to polish the transition between your coping and the ceramic perfect, smooth, as smooth as possible. Because this could be the reason for later on a chipping. The bisque situation. So usually sometimes what I do is when the bisque bake, I do the occlusional centric contact points. Uh, sometimes I add a composite if I need uh, a bigger support as far as occlusion, if I want to share as much as possible the, uh, the, the excursive movements. So I try to improve the occlusion as much as possible, sometimes grinding the lower incisor because I don't have an even occlusal plane of the lower anterior teeth. Try to bevel them in order to create not only the aesthetic but also the functional aspect. This is, you have seen when we uh, check the bisque situation in the mount, and we have some minor corrections, then for the technician and the audience, we don't have to fire it once again, because I think that how often you fire your ceramic, how lower your value will be. This means that when I have to do a minor correction, I will do this directly together with my glaze firing. This means a part of the firing procedure has to be a sort of vacuum, and then less. After 800 degrees, vacuum salts down, it goes to 910 degrees to get a perfect glaze firing. When I see here the, this uh, small video, the transition between the zirconia coping and the ceramic, I take some glaze, I take some stains, and then I will correct this kind of transitions because I need to be sure that it will as smooth as possible. So after my firing, I take my diamond paste and I, yeah, like I told you, as smooth as possible. And then you can see after your glaze firing and you have polished it by hand with diamond paste that you don't see the differences in color, but this is not the main problem. The main problem is that the transition between the zirconia coping and our ceramic is as smooth as possible. It's one line. On this image, you can see that we have a transition between the buckle planes, the buckle area, the incisal edge and the palatal side, it has to be as sharp as a knife. So we have to reproduce this in your restoration. The crowns in the patient's mounts, we have some optical properties. There is no blocking of the light. The light goes through the coping into the gingiva with our fluorescent coping. This is very important. And this you can see here. 
You can see here pretty yeah, much yeah. all the optical yeah. properties also on UV and natural yeah. light to really be able to mask as much as possible what uh, we wanted yeah. to create. When I interrupt you, uh, Iñaki, the small thing was you could have seen that we have painted a little bit of lateral incisor because normally I told you the staining material they are in the uh, for in the industry there is not 100% fluorescent. So every time when I would like to stain something at the buckle, I feel very sad. But in this case, we had no chance, Iñaki. In this case, it was the, the poor amount of space, and uh, the problem was that uh, I didn't allow enough space yeah, yeah. for my technician. I knew it, but I didn't want no, to, take, okay, this is to change my pitfall, apartment. Eh? <laughs> and can we change it, or can we uh, avoid these pitfalls? No. Well, I could have no. prepped more, but I would run into the chimney of my, of my yeah. apartment, so, mm. and I would have been weakening quite yeah. a bit. Uh, the other issue is the uh, cementation. There are is, there is a lot of issues about it. I never use one cord that goes around the abutment. We always choose two cords totally independent, one in a balcal and one in a palatal. In that way, I'm controlling the, the removal of the cement. Uh, I've been using this technique for, for a long time. There is something that is missing uh, in the pictures is that as I use my abut final abutment from the first day of my prosthetic phase, I always, in my protocol, uh, unscrew my abutment before cementing to really make sure that there is no any, any cement excess below my finishing line. This is what we do routinely. We clean the abutment with gas and sterile, uh, and sterile water and we re-screw uh, it back again to make sure that no, uh, no cement uh, has been stuck to the uh, tissue all around, and then we torque it, and this w the results pretty much a month after where we started, the volume that we were able to achieve, pretty much trying to copy the contralateral side, and this is the initial situation and you can see that maybe on the mesial aspect uh, of the lateral incisor, uh, the color is kind of uh, washed out. Yeah. This is due to the, the, the higher value due to the copying yeah. and to the poor space that we, we had in there. To create such kind of crowns, it's very important to see the patients in the lab or in the office by Anyaki because the luster, you never can check it on the mini image. Never. So normally we take our uh, polished crown, you check it in the mount, you take it out, you polish it, you check it once again, it's too high, it's too less, then you have to adapt it all the time. It takes time. Yes, the luster should be always provided by the dentist yeah. and Actually, has yes. to learn from yeah. the dental technician how to do that. You can see the control of the canine that is touching with regard to the central incisor.